pleasure to be here. Um, and just to, to clarify things, uh, for some of you have asked me, um, does Dell Computers have a medical school? Um, and the answer is no. The Dell Medical School is UT Austin's new medical school. And, and thankfully, the Dell family gave us a, a large gift to get it kicked off. So if there was one person you could point to in the history of medical education that was um, most important to defining it today, it would be this guy, Abraham Flexner, who in 1910 wrote a report that defined the way medical education um, has been done ever since. And it was based on what was going on in medicine at the time, which was, it was just basically a bunch of quackery. So a lot of therapies with no evidence. Um, and you can see Osler's quote here about, you know, first duty is to get uh, patients not to take medicines. Um, things have changed dramatically since that time. So in one one uh, notable change has been this explosion in medical knowledge. So this is just relative units of medical knowledge. And you can see it stayed pretty flat and was relatively small until um, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and obviously we're off the chart now. And there's just no way to learn everything in medicine. We all recognize that, and subspecialization is a part of that. But even with subspecialization, there's just too much going on too quickly to expect that to be absorbed in someone's brain. But in spite of that, and in spite of all the other things that have happened in, in uh, healthcare, uh, medical education has been remarkably unchanged. Um, still, this was defined by, uh, by Flexner 100 years ago, two years lecture-based, two years clinical rotation, strong emphasis on basic science, again, that foundation uh, to get the evidence, and then a heavy reliance on lectures and testing. And there have been some, some movement here. We've seen some new curricula coming out of, of a variety of different institutions. Um, but, uh, but basically, this has been the framework and then sort of uh, emblematic of, the, of what's going on in medical education is this thing called the Krebs cycle. Um, the Krebs cycle is something that is still required in almost everyone's curriculum to, for uh, the physicians in training to learn. Every single molecule, every single transition step, to memorize that completely, not just learn it conceptually, memorize that, and be able to draw the entire thing from memory. Now, most practicing physicians, pretty much all practicing physicians, realize that that is just, I mean, it, I guess it's a rite of passage, but it, it certainly isn't useful in practice. And yet this still remains um, uh, critical to medical education in pretty much all uh, medical schools. So if there was an image of where academic medicine is today, this would be my image. It's basically this ossified system that just doesn't want to move. But what if you could start from scratch? What if you could begin anew? And that's really the opportunity that we had in Austin. So University of Texas at Austin, big university, great university, never had a med school for weird reasons. Austin was the largest city in the US without a med school. The populace voted to increase their property tax to bring a med school to Austin. So the Dells get their name on it, they gave an important gift, but that gift from the community is much more important and much more relevant to the, to the fabric of the school. So that gives us a chance to really start from scratch and say, gosh, you know, what should a med school be about? What should academic medicine look like? Um, and of course, immediately we can do the easy things, right? So we know in adult education, adult education has moved quite a bit. And we know that there's some standard approaches in adult education that work really well. So flipped classrooms, experiential learning, um, tracking competencies, gaming and simulation, and group problem solving are some examples of those things. So we can immediately do that. We're not based on, on lectures anymore. We don't need that anymore. We can, we can change it up. And we can build our spaces around that new way of learning. So we don't have a lecture hall. We have a large group learning um, room, which is this one, where there's demonstration from the front of the room and then problems that are solved around tables on, on different levels. But that's not the hard stuff. Um, and that's not really the interesting stuff. Um, the hard stuff is to think about what the physician of the future should look like. And that's probably not the physician of today. And then design our curriculum to address what that physician of the future should look like. So, just like Flexner was looking at the state of American medicine in 1910 when he was defining 
um, the, what should be in the curriculum for, for medical schools, we should be doing the same today. So what is the state of American medicine in 2016? Well, this is a familiar story. We know that the cost of healthcare continue to rise, so the per person spending goes up dramatically every year. We applaud it when it's just you know, two or three times the rate of inflation. Um, as though that's a success. And yet, if you look at any variety of different measures for what the return on that investment is, they're pretty meager. So yes, we've had an increase in life expectancy, but it's a modest one, and it certainly hasn't kept pace with inflation. So there's no, no measured uh, um, increase in life expectancy, for example, over the past few years. So huge investment in very small return. And in fact, if we just compare country to country, the US is the number one spender of healthcare worldwide, but we rank 34th by World Health Organization rankings in terms of the health that's produced, the healthiness of our population. That puts us between Costa Rica and Cuba. Cuba spends one eleventh of what we do on healthcare, and yet the average life expectancy in Cuba is the same as in the US, in spite of all our advances and technology and access to, to all kinds of advanced therapies, it doesn't seem to matter in terms of major health indicators. So pretty remarkable. So the healthcare system, in fact, in the US, and this obviously isn't unique to us, but maybe um, more, more exceptionally <laughs> demonstrated in the US health um, care system, is broken. We're heavily invested in the status quo and then very focused on doing more rather than doing better. In fact, we get paid for doing more. We don't get paid for doing better. The whole economic system is, is, is about fee-for-service and, and, and uh, doing things even when they may not um, have a major impact. And then we end up treating the sick rather than promoting health. Again, this is driven by our healthcare system where we get paid a whole lot more for that end-of-life care than we do for keeping people healthy and out of the hospital. And then, of course, we're resistant to technology and other approaches when they enhance efficiency. So even email, which is ubiquitous, hardly a, even a technology today, ubiquitous in every industry, it's not actually a normal, it's not possible to really email your physician and get an answer to an easy question. And instead, we require an office visit for that, which is absolutely insane. Um, some questions about side effects from medications that could easily be addressed immediately in an email then require this unbelievably wasteful um, period of time with, uh, uh, for the patient and also for the physician. And it's not gratifying for a physician to do things that are, that are not necessary. I'd also argue it's not just the healthcare system that's broken, it's in fact the whole way that we think about community health. So, you know, we spend a, a lot of time talking about doctors and their tools, so their tools being drugs and devices, and now more time talking about care settings, so we're starting to understand doctors and teams and all of that, but the real opportunity, if we really want to have an impact in health, and this is what Cuba figured out, we need to go out to the community and figure out how we change community behaviors, influence the communities. Now, this is, right now, we don't, we pay everything on the healthcare side and very little on the community side. So philanthropies and the public health system are meant to cover those community aspects, even when those could be cost saving downstream. So we're not directing the dollars towards the things that matter in the healthcare system. So the, the question is, I mean, if this is where we are today, um, and I mean, it's even worse than this, right? I mean, I could talk about physician burnt out, burnout and, and um, and the, the dissatisfaction that both physicians have with the profession and also patients have with the, uh, with the industry. Um, it, the question isn't, you know, can we create a better system? Because whatever we created today or envisioned today would be outdated five or 10 years from now. It's really about, can we create a better system that, that accepts innovations, that creates and accepts innovations more rapidly to move the health ecosystem forward. So an ecosystem for health innovation. So, so that's an entirely different thing than just a med school, right? It's the ecosystem. And then we have to think about what the role of the medical school is in that, and then what the role of the um, physician in, the, in training, the future physician, is in that. 
So for us then, instead of focusing on, okay, how do we become you know, a top 10 medical school, we, our focus is, is on how do we make Austin, our city, a model healthy city. So in this case, it's not Austin as the healthiest city that it can be, but also as a model for how to change an ecosystem in order so that others can, can follow. So the purposefully focusing locally as a laboratory for how to create disseminatable um, discoveries to other places. So um, I, can, I could talk a lot more about how we envision that doing. I'll come back to it in just a minute. But let me dive to, to the educational components then. So if that's the role of a med school, is to drive innovations and to support a, a new ecosystem, then what's the role of physicians in this new ecosystem? So what it's not is the traditional model of medicine. So this is the, you know, the, the, the shining physician at the center with all the blue people around them. This isn't going to work anymore. Um, this, uh, this is fine for uh, when, we, when we make special the individual characteristics of the physician, but the reality is the problems in healthcare are not individual problems, they're systems problems. And so the physician needs to be working in teams and not um, not on their own with people supporting them. And in fact, there's a lot of, of uh, science around what makes effective teams and how effective teams can solve problems much more readily than ineffective teams. And ineffective teams being a team being dominated by a single player. And interestingly, we can use this not just in our curriculum, but we can also use it in how we select our students. So instead of using the traditional approach to interview, you know, do two face-to-face -face interviews, this is pretty typical for med schools, couple of face-to-face -face interviews, and the rest of it's MCATs and grades and, and uh, other achievements. For us, we, we have a really unusual selection process that involves some rapid-fire questions to students and then a group problem-solving task where we put them in a room, five of them, and they have to solve a problem. And what we're observing is how they work as a team. And it's unbelievably revealing in terms of the character um, and the maturity, um, the communication skills of our applicants. But leadership is also critical. So physicians not only haven't proven to be great leaders in defining these innovations in healthcare and then moving them forward, they've actually resisted. And no surprise, a lot of these innovations have made life worse for physicians, maybe because they haven't been guiding them. Um, and so in the future, we need to be thinking about, well, where are the physicians that are going to look at these systems, come up with these solutions, and then lead, which is very difficult, the changes that are required in order to make transformational change in the healthcare system. And th that leadership is going to be a different kind of leadership, right? So it may not look like the Steve Jobs leadership. It may look a little bit more like the Nelson Mandela leadership in enabling the entire um, framework to come together and solve these problems, in encouraging innovative ideas from the broad spectrum of people who are actually affected and, and um, are best positioned to create solutions. So how do we translate that into something real? Well, for us, it's, um, we, we make it interprofessional from day one. So we have a, um, it's a required class for us, for the nursing school, for social work, for pharmacy. Um, and then engineering and business are also participants, but it's an elective for them. And they continue in this, in this uh, course, all, all those groups for the first year, and then our students with a few others and electives for the other three years. We focus on multidisciplinarity. So the, actually the first um, uh, group that we put together was um, across disciplines was uh, with fine arts. Um, we created the Design Institute uh, for Health with um, uh, the, Stacey Chang, the guy who led IDEO's healthcare practice previously. He quit there and came to lead this group. And that then becomes part of this design thinking and this notion of working across um, uh, different boundaries. And we have um, programs in communication, um, in uh, uh, policy, in business and law, so all of those as well. 
Um, and then the leadership skills, and uh, so uh, if I had longer, I'd tell you more about how we, how we encourage um, this and have a leadership program, um, but it's been really interesting to learn the science of leadership, you know, what actually works and what, what might need to be specific for, for medicine as opposed to what works in business. And then to make it real, we've, we have taken what's normally a two-year basic science curriculum, turn it into a one-year, and then that gives us an extra year. And in that, we have what we call the innovation and leadership block, and they work on real projects that have the potential to improve health, working directly with payers. So this is the other realization. We've got to go directly to payers, solve their problems to get the economics aligned with the kinds of solutions that we in society want. So this is a special time, you know, or when are we waiting for the meteor to hit, right? I mean, uh, um, things are pretty awful today in, in the healthcare system, and it is going to take a kind of transformational change um, to, to, um, to get through this and to define a better way. I don't think we're going to see that from the big P policy world, um, uh, in, at, at least not in the U.S., anytime soon. So the, we need to find the way to make those changes in the, the system that we've been handed. Focusing on health innovation, focusing on getting the payments aligned with society's interest in health, and then training students aligned to meet that future, that's where we think the real opportunities are. Thank you very much. Thank you.